My name is Laura March and I'm the coordinator of faculty technology initiatives over at CTRL. And my office is in 201B and please come visit me. Please come chat about any kind of educational technology that you're interested in. And um, if you'd like to have access to the presentation itself, you can head over to that URL and just follow along with me and keep, I'll have links to all of the apps on it so you can direct uh, your phone directly from the presentation. And I made the settings on this Google presentation open to anybody so you don't need to log in or have a Gmail address already. So with that, I want to give a plug for a new event that CTRL will be running called our monthly app advisor. Get the pun, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> a little groaning, but every month we're going to have a couple hours set aside just for people to drop in and come chat with us about what apps they're using, what functions that they find they think could be better in their in their classes and maybe be filled by apps. Um, we had a great session with one of the apps we'll talk today. And Courtney actually came up with a great um, what was it? A uh, flashcard app, Study Bloom. And we'll, we'll have Courtney. I will be there. Courtney, our lovely uh, graduate right, consultant. Yeah. Facilitating and also work at CTRL. Yes, <laughs> along with um, a few other graduate consultants that have different types of phone. They have uh, a lot of experience with using apps on their phone for coursework and can tell you which they prefer to use and which they say are a little bit clunky. Um, so please come join us, 1.30 to 3.30, Hearst 204. Hopefully we'll have actually some appetizers, meaning Oreo cookies, <laughs> available for you as well. <laughs> and with that being said, um, here's... Can you exact the um, URL for the sure. it's, presentation? Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And just a quick tip, um, for most modern browsers, we no longer need to use the HTTP colon backslash backslash. So whenever you see that, you don't even need to bother typing it in. You can just head to bit.ly slash mobile toolkit and it'll go to that um, address. But it's kind of a marker uh, if you're showing your students um, to go to a web URL, they might not necessarily know it. Um, it's just a, a quick tip. And I really believe in making sure that everybody is okay with the content we're going through. If I go too fast or if you get really bored, please be vocal. I want this to be a discussion. Um, and especially if you have a better app than, than the one that I found, don't keep it to yourself. Let us know. <laughs> so with that being said, is that good? Does everybody have this URL somewhere for it handy? Terrific. I decided to start this presentation by finding functions first about what apps um, what I want to, to fulfill. And these are the 10 areas I thought would be great for an app um, to be handy, to be there for a professor that needed something on the go in their hand um, and that was conducive to the actual mobile device itself versus a laptop versus pen and paper. Uh, and so with, with this being said, I wanted to uh, focus on customizing each device to fit your own personal needs. And that can be done on any type of phone. Um, I also wanted to discuss QR codes, and that was actually a special request we had, and we'll go over what, what they are and some options for uh, an app to use. Um, a whiteboard. Some classes don't even have blackboard. Does this? Yeah, this has a whiteboard itself, but other ones just have a projection screen and don't have a chalkboard um, here or on other campuses. And we can use an iPad, a tablet, or even a phone to fulfill that same function. Uh, same with the PDF scanner, which I emailed about you on Wednesday. That you can, you don't need to have those big bulky Xerox copiers anymore. You can just use your phone. Um, some file management, with making sure that you know where all of your <laughs> files and documents are and can access them on the go. Some um, attendance record keepers, so it's easy to have everything collected in one area, and you can even have the app uh, set a reminder to when you should be taking attendance in each class and add a picture of your students, great stuff. The virtual computing lab, which I'm not sure if many people uh, may be aware of, but you can actually have access to a CTRL lab computer desktop from any device that has an internet um, connection. So you can use the you know, a PC Windows computer on your iPhone when you need to. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about back channel discussions, which is the same over here. A back channel discussion is really an online conversation that's happening at the same time as live remarks or um, another event that's happening in the same space. It's just a different channel, so a back channel. Um, also going on to, to memorization, again, with those flashcards that can be used on your phone on the go, and some group communication tools. 
So I think that these are all topics uh, that can be helped through educational technology. Once again, if you can think of an app you use that fulfills one of these functions, please don't keep quiet, let us know. And without further ado, here are my big picks. I'm going through um, just some customization options. The app that I chose for the QR reader app is just QR codes, it's just QR reader, reader. it's by far the most popular. Um, Scanner Pro is my pick for a PDF scanner, but Genius Scan works on both Android and, iTunes, and uh, iOS devices. iOS is um, the mobile platform, so iOS and Mac and iPhone are all kind of interchangeable. Google Play and Android are interchangeable. Are there any Windows users in here? Windows phone users? Okay. <laughs> well, I didn't pick anything specifically. It's a very small population, but if you know anything, um, we can always chat about that later. Uh, Google Drive, and we'll talk about Google Drive versus Dropbox. Teacher's Aid for attendance is wonderful, but they don't have an uh, Android version yet, but the two top functions are kind of this attendance tracking and picking a random student. And uh, yeah, come join us, don't worry. <laughs> um, but they do have free apps for that on Android. VCL, once again, can be accessed anywhere. For this back channel discussion, I just wanted to go over four different options that can be um, used on Android or iOS or a browser or an actual clicker. Has anybody used iClickers, actual machines, the remotes? Okay, so you'll be able to share some of your experience with us, hopefully. <laughs> oh, there's a tongue for that. <laughs> um, memorization, Study Blue is both Android and iOS, as is Remind 101 and with all sort of uh, dumb phones, I guess we could call them as well. So let's start with those device options. And what I really want to stress too is you need to make and customize your device to fit your own personalized, your own needs. Um, so I think we should start out with uh, basic options that make you more comfortable and make the phone more comfortable for you. And these options are available through any mobile device. I have an iPhone uh, 5S, but these options are available on Android. They're just in different areas. They're in a different folder, or they're on a different icon on your screen. I highly recommend Google or Bing searching and saying if you want to uh, make the screen of your Samsung Galaxy dimmer or more contrast, Google Samsung Galaxy screen brightness, and it'll pop up immediately. Um, so this is kind of a, a trip through my command center. How many um, iPhones do we have? Can we raise your hands? How many Androids do we have? Terrific. Do you mind me asking what, um, which Nexus. platform? Nexus? Wonderful. What? <laughs> well, that's actually taking up as being like the number one Android right now. And people are saying that they are loving the, the Google Nexus for QR code stuff. It comes preloaded um, with a QR code reader. Very interesting. Um, so just to talk about what this command center is, and it's available when you just swipe up your phone, anywhere just from the bottom of the screen to the top, and it comes with some great options, like uh, turning on that airplane mode, uh, maybe switching your Wi-Fi on and off, the Bluetooth so you can connect it to a keyboard. This is a Bluetooth keyboard. Um, those sort of options are really available just with a swipe up. Um, one thing that's really interesting is this do not disturb center of your, of your phone. Have, has anybody taken advantage of that? Sure, share us with how you use it. Um, I have it set for automatic, so mm -hmm. every night my phone automatically shuts or goes on silent from midnight to 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. Unless it's like certain people who call me, then it'll ring. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, Right, that's great. And um, when you make a phone contact, you can put people into groups. And one of those groups could be favorites. So maybe you selected that your favorites can call you during Do Not Disturb and it'll still ring. Also, I have mine to set if somebody calls twice from the same number within three minutes, it'll go through. Just in case there's an emergency. It's never happened before, but it makes me feel better that it's on. Um, and there are other areas that will also be some easy customizations for you if you just don't want to get your alerts you know during class time or you don't want to get them at night or you want to shut off from students you know that's that's your place to go and there's some also interesting things in the new update such as accessing your flashlight from right there turn it right on right off you don't need a new app for that it's right in your command center um, as well as the calculator and timer 
right there. Uh, the, the phone has always kind of been there on your lock screen. You don't even need to unlock your phone to access this stuff. So if you're stumbling in the dark, just swipe your finger up and you'll be able to have access to that flashlight. Or if you're like me and need to set the timer for the laundry, the laundromat, it's just right there. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. You can also uh, sometimes ask Siri, uh, set the timer or, or set the timer for 10 minutes or 11.5. <laughs> and, and she's surprisingly, you know, willing to do that. She's receptive to that. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you get a little alarm. Right? Yeah, figure out how to get it to turn off. That's, so that's great fun. for group activities, too. If you wanted your groups to only work for five minutes together, tell Siri immediately. Go ahead. What's auto rotation? Auto rotation is great. So I just hit it on over here on this screen. That means that the screen won't change when I move my phone around. And that's really handy when presenting, and I probably should have had that on to begin with. So, so sorry with that. <laughs> so to get on to, um, I guess, the, the Google, is this, is this what your screen looks like with Google Nexus? Uh, yeah, that's one of the screen, yeah, my second screen, yeah. Wonderful, have you customized anything yet? Uh, a, a little bit, not much. I didn't get the uh, phone too long ago, so. Okay. Yeah. Was there anything in your previous phones that you want to make sure to do? Uh, well, this is really my first smartphone. So oh, congratulations. So. Congratulations. Well, I would definitely recommend if you have any, um, accessible, just to check out the accessibility options too for any, anybody that might need larger type or uh, hearing or any other visual or um, there's also physical and motor skill settings that you can make the home button either more sensitive or less sensitive to when you touch it. And I really, really do suggest adjusting the text size in your phone uh, because the median age of people needing reading glasses is 36 and a half. <laughs> so, and you can just take care of that through the settings, general text size and make it easier on yourself so you're not struggling so hard. Although I do know my mother really just does voice text messages instead of having to, to bother with um to bother with typing with the little <laughs> letters. So let's go on to QR codes. And a QR code stands for quick response. It's really just an advanced barcode um, that sends somebody looking from the physical world, like a piece of paper or a sign, into the virtual world through their phone. And that could be any sort of like a specific URL. Let's get it all, like the contact numbers, any of these many ways that you could use a, a URL. I think it's pretty interesting that it was developed in Japan in, the, in I guess, the mid-90s because they wanted to be able to do kanji and add that to a barcode. Um, so it was a lot of uh, development of, of lots of information being packed into a smaller area. And feel free if you want to check out and scan some of these. Um, you can get information about Abraham Lincoln, Einstein, and the Mona Lisa just from there. So it would be a great way to have, um, if you're doing anything in a gallery setting, lots of people use them in museums to get more information about the artist. Um, I also found some great things to do with, uh, within higher ed. Uh, Googling using QR codes in higher ed, 34.3 million results. <laughs> and anything from putting a QR code on your syllabus, if you want your students to have that contact information, or specific URLs for their quick reference on that, on that syllabus. Um, and some teachers even use it for immediate answers. They'll have the QR codes pasted around the room, so when they take a quiz, they can immediately see what the answers are after they hand it in. So, interesting. <laughs> and there are also some links within the presentations of actually generating those barcodes yourself. Um, a cute little GIF, really, just, you know, start up that app, it'll have a camera, you point the phone at that code, and the web page, whatever information, pops right up into there. Anybody have any other uses of QR codes or any thoughts? Anybody using any um, near-field communication or, like, visual scanning yet? Those are kind of two newer technologies that are trying to get off, you know, and I think become as big as QR codes are now. It's using uh, radio frequencies for near field communication, and the visual um, scanning is really just taking pictures with your camera and seeing if Google has, you know, an information about that visual area. How about any, anybody use QR codes or seen any really bad uses of QR codes? You want to share? Yeah. I made one, you know, for my lab website and put it on a window of my lab and people look at it and they say, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and then and they say, oh, they're, oh, that's a nice QR code, they're impressed. Mm -hmm. so, but mm -hmm. I, on the other hand, I don't know how many people might have gone by in the dead of night and used it, I'm sure. <laughs> Very popular. Mm -hmm. But I put out 
outside my door mm -hmm. instead of all the stuff on each of those in the store. Right. You actually have to do a couple of Good. steps to get to the info. Could probably put it on Blackboard because it, I mean, a regular screen mm -hmm. would still give it enough resolution, right? Yeah, I just, what I've tried to take them from screens, you need a lot of white space around it because it gets a little jumbled. Sometimes the screen flickers oh. for some reason. Mm -hmm. But I've certainly been able to, to do it on screens. But again, you have to remember that this is taking the students to something on their mobile phone. So if you wanted to take them to a page on, um, you know, start their writing assignment and you don't want them to be writing their assignment on your phone, then it wouldn't quite work for a QR code. <laughs> Yes, it would. It would yeah, download whatever sweet. app. Mm -hmm. Putting it on the on Blackboard doesn't really as much unless they can navigate. Mm -hmm. So onto that onto that PDF scanning. Um, so I recommend these apps. Actually, there is a PDF scanner within that free QR code app. But it's not very. Uh, it doesn't focus very well. So some other options are Genius Scan, which is for Android or iOS. Um, once again, it's not like 100% good for uh, very focused um, work or PDF scanning, it doesn't quite mimic that, but the Scanner Pro does. And if you find yourself scanning lots of PDFs and you want something um, to use on your mobile phone, I could even see investing in that $7. So this is Genius Scam. You just kind of hover over that, uh, that document you'd like to scan. It'll ask you to pick the um, pick the corners of the document. It'll show you where that what that image looks like. You can make some adjustment in the images over on here. This little settings area, rotate it. This button sends your whatever's on the screen somewhere else. Does anybody, has anybody used this button before for anything? Yeah, sure. So just to upload it to try and put it in Dropbox. Yeah, definitely. It's kind of a smart button that it knows what files connect to that either the, an image. So people use that to uh, do photos, when you send photos to somebody. Um, let me see if I can do something easy here. So if you take out on that screen, let's say I have a lovely photo. My dog just learned how to shake over the weekend. Um, you see in the bottom left corner all the things that I can do with that. I can send it as a message, email. I have my email synced with my phone. I also have Twitter and Facebook, but there are other things like copying, airplay, assigning it to contacts. And there's really, it's, it's super smart in what it can do. Mm -hmm. Laura, it's so clear to me. Can I have scan like a short story from somewhere? Are there any kind of, so are there any rights? Do we have copyright issues to deal with? Or the fair or use. <laughs> sure. It's definitely possible that one could do that. Um, there is some really good literature about fair use and what you can use for your coursework that the library, or I can even put you in, in the right direction if you're interested in, in that. Yeah, a couple of great brochures. Very fair enough. And those, sorry. Well, sure, yeah. The library can scan 10% of the book. Okay. No, but with this, can I? Can yeah, I but it, it would fall under the same rules oh, of fair use as okay. to what you can distribute. So I would assume it would be similar. Similar. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I was just wondering. With the free version of Genius Scan, you'll only be able to email it to yourself. All those other options will be grayed out. Uh, when you pay 99 cents for the app, you'll be able to give it to your Dropbox, your Evernote, Google Drive. Um, so now on to Scanner Pro. <coughs> the, what I like best about this is it automatically detects the corner. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I didn't Sure. Mm -hmm. You can scan things in or make them a PDF. Mm -hmm. How can you save them? Exactly. Put it right. <laughs> exactly. I think that's next start and two. Yeah. You can you can choose, but you should choose and be aware of where they're they're hanging out. Um, especially uh, if you want to talk about privacy and students' work and making sure that you have a lockdown on where their content lives um, instead of it being publicly available. So. I guess continuing on this line of, of why I like this scanner the best is because it automatically detects those edges and sends you some easy uh, settings right afterwards, you know, choosing if it's that grayscale, black or white, um, doing some quick and easy contrast where you don't have to go into another menu immediately. And you can do multiple pages um, with both Genius Scan and this scan as well. And this 
Scanner Pro um, also has an easy link to fax, <laughs> as Brian and I were joking about. I remember walking to FedEx Kinko's for fax, and while it does cost money, it costs um, $1 for two pages. That's about half the price of um, other apps. There's Genius Scan, Genius Fax, they kind of go together, has about a uh, dollar per page. Um, but I can't believe that I can just do it from my phone instead of walking out to go make some faxes. <laughs> Um, with these scanned images, any of the scanner apps that are out there right now, they're scanning your text as images. And you do have to do an extra step of text recognition through Adobe Acrobat if you want them to be able to be copyable for your students or accessible with a um, screen reader. So the screen reader needs to have each of those um, characters already that character information within the page. Um, so you need to go through that Adobe Reader extra step and please come talk to me if you're interested in that versus having something just as a, a scanned image. Oh, I'm swiping the screen of that. What do you think about <laughs> for this? So now on to, to whiteboards. Does anybody here teach in a classroom that doesn't have a chalkboard or a whiteboard at all? Or know what your classes are going to be like? I'm yeah? Interesting. Yeah. How have you handled that? Uh, we got them to change the chalkboards out to whiteboards. <laughs> and we now project in the center part, so we still have access to the stuff on either side. Wonderful. But we used a document camera for a while to mm, document camera solve some of that issue. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, one way that I've seen it being solved is using an iPad as the as the whiteboard as well. And the first app, I guess we'll start with Android, is just called Whiteboard. The second one is EduCreations for iOS. Um, Whiteboard just kind of looks like your old Microsoft Paint uh, thing where you can upload images using that image file over here. Um, you know, pick that color as you want, um, save it, you can save it to your cell phone and then email it out so you'll have a record of whatever whiteboard uh, content you have made, which is really nice to have. <laughs> so you can have a, you can see how people made equations. You can, you know, ask students to write, uh, write things with on it. Um, or you could, you know, upload an image of the Mona Lisa and make comments directly on it. This is the iOS version, which is, <laughs> Wonderful. Edu Creations is one of many whiteboard applications they have for the iPad, um, but it takes the concept of a whiteboard even further. And this one, you can even have multiple pages and record yourself speaking while taking all of the notes. It's completely free. Um, there's a large Edu Creations community around, uh, so there's lots of support if you run into trouble. You can always Google, you know, my Edu Creations won't use the black color um, and somebody will say oh I have that problem too figure it out um, I think we should even go to it has anybody used Edu Creations? tell us what your experience has been um, a lot of fun uh, very easy to bring in photos and record on it um, you can't I don't, I don't think you can re-record on it but you can no. set up some great stuff and then send it to people and I used it for a financial report uh, as treasurer I jazzed it up with a motorcycle, I have a <laughs> soundtrack, um, and then the numbers, you know, they all went to sleep, but then I have bar graphs, and that was very exciting, so it was, and it was easy to do. Um, yeah. I didn't, I didn't systematically evaluate the responses that I should, hmm. but, uh, and I used it to um, draw something and then email it to a student who had a question, mm. you know, online course in self-management, and they said, Fine. how do you graph that? And I thought, I can't describe it in words, but here's how you graph it, and I can just draw it with my finger. Mm -hmm. Oh, that'd be terrific, especially for like mathematical equations and like how do I work for do long divisions? Yeah. <laughs> graphics. The graphics of graphing. Totally. Yeah, or even drawing, I guess, bonds or you could use that too. conjugations maybe for, yeah, for verbs. Yeah. So if you could just, you know, create a new lesson. And then they can see you draw. Right. And actually, as you draw, you can record that so they see you actually. Yeah. That's really wonderful. Cool. So over here, um, let's say I, I would have already saved some, some pictures. So they would be in my photos. And today I want to talk about, you know, American Gothic. You know, just bring it right in and start record. And today's lecture is, is being started. Um, we want to highlight the shading over here. We want to discuss um, portraiture. 
we want to type something more extensively and uh, people don't like my handwriting. So are you drawing all of that with your finger? Mm -hmm. okay. And the uh, stylus would be really useful in this too. Um, I find that it's easier to write <laughs> with a stylus. Um, they can be pretty inexpensive or even free, um, a swag. Uh, and then switch onto another page and go into another picture um, or something else, a, a completely different topic. You know, go crazy. And they record the pausing is, sorry, your recording is paused while you bring in a new picture just because it takes that uh, extra step that people probably wouldn't want to hear while they're looking at it later. Um, and then you can bring, go back and forth and it's still recording your actions of going back and forth. It'll record whatever you have to say over here. Um, you hit pause when you're done, save that lesson, give a title, um, let's say art. And I usually choose to do things privately and then come back to it if I need to do something later. So if I choose it as private, um, save it, it goes into uh, EduCreations Cloud. And from there, you can choose to do things like. And today's lecture is being started. Again, this is exactly what I what I started. So here, I mean, that's the whole lesson for you right there. And it, I guess you could hear me before I just turn the the mute off. It's it's me talking. And you can copy that link and send it in an email or if your email is already hooked up to your device, send it in an email right there. And I've got the link to go see it. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Does anybody else use any other drawing apps or whiteboard type apps they'd want to share? Oh, sure. Um, I use just Sketchbook one. Oh yeah, how did that work? It was fine. I mean, I ended up using more of the whiteboard the following year, but in terms of <coughs> just writing stuff, it was okay. And then there's one called the Serity mm -hmm. um, that you, when I was trying to use it for, I ended up going back to just a straight clicker, um, was being able to control my laptop from somewhere else, because mm. I was teaching in a 96 seat lecture room, um, and I wanted to be able to move around, um, but still access more than just slides huh. and stuff, because you can, Basically, you can connect it, you take snapshot with something like a QR code, and it then um, mirrors your desktop or your laptop on uh, the iPad. Hmm. And so then you can go back and forth. Uh, so if I need to go in and out of other programs uh, on the laptop, I can do that, which aren't part of you know, the iPad. That's Doserai? Doseri. Doseri? Yeah, D O C E R I. Has anybody else had any uh, experience with Doseri? Interesting. I I have to go check that out. Sorry, as I log back in, I guess I have myself connected everywhere. Have anybody noticed that if you get in, you know, Google on a couple of uh, devices, it'll kick you off one or the other. Yeah, it's it's a good, you know, safety. Yeah. Um, so heading over on to the next area, which is file management. I, I really looked into Dropbox and Google Docs and Drive, and personally I think Google Docs came up, or Google Drive came out on top. I use many of them, um, and I think that whatever you find to suit your needs, keep going for that. Um, but I guess my big public service announcement, this begins with uh, what happens to those files, is <laughs> really you gotta save them and you gotta know where they're being saved. And I guess my public service announcement um, is that you need to be in three places. They need to be in three separate places. They need to be local, either on your phone or your computer or um, wherever you're kind of making that right now, uh, the iPad. You also need to have a hard backup, so meaning an external hard drive that's somewhere else that it actually exists in kind of a physical encoded on that computer chip form. Um, it could also be a USB, I think there's like a, a tera gig now for like 20, 30 bucks. Yeah, oh, terabyte gig. Oh. The, the, I remember when I bought my first like five gig one and it was like $70. 
Um, and also I suggest once on the cloud, and that could be uh, in a Google Drive, in your Box account, in your Dropbox, um, SkyDrive. Does anybody, uh, I guess there's the, the Mac, me, iCloud account too. Um, Does anybody use anything iCloud. else? It's iCloud. <laughs> it's not me anymore. <laughs> Things, things get simplified. Um, so what, what of these do you guys use? Do you use um, Drive or Box or, or Dropbox? Eh? Dropbox? Dropbox mm -hmm. and Cloud occasionally. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then an uh, external drive at home and at AU and... <laughs> yeah, you also do get, you do get space at AU to store things and, and everything. Mm -hmm. G Drive. Yeah. Um, I was on Dropbox originally. Mm -hmm. I then switched over to Google Drive solely because Drive gives you more gigabytes of memory up front for free mm -hmm. than Dropbox does. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a five versus two for Drive versus Dropbox. Actually, it's 15, but those 15 gigs are spread between Google Mail, um, your photos, and Drive. So you can possibly have 12 gigs of Drive and only three for Mail, but for all intents and purposes, it's, it's um, five versus two. Mm -hmm. Oh, terrific. And it has share rooms in it the way that kind of works the way Dropbox does. So it's a lot more secure. Hmm. Yes. Now, when you um, back up your phone, does that back up all the documents on your phone? You actually make those selections within your iTunes account. So when you, have you plugged in your phone into the computer and it'll come up with like what's on your iPhone or your iPad? Within that, you can see what's being synced. And you can also make those changes on your phone itself. Let's see if I can get into those real quick. Um, and some people like to save things to the cloud from their phone, so I have my phone, some areas of my phone, backed up um, every day. Let's see if I can find where that is. You've got to check data and documents to get it to back up. The data and documents, mm -hmm. it'll back up your iPad or iPhone automatically. Totally. But it may, it may seem to be on your phone or iPad, but it may be in the cloud, actually. And you pull mm -hmm. it down. So I got to this iCloud area straight from the, the settings. I hit iCloud, and things that I want to be backed up are my contacts, which are in the cloud, um, notes that are in the cloud. But I don't want things like my mail, because that just takes up too much space. Sorry. Um, and I, of course, I want Find My Phone to be in the cloud. And Find My Phone is uh, when you lose it, <laughs> or when you don't remember if you actually brought it with you to work today and you want to make sure it wasn't stolen. <laughs> and keeping the iCloud location in for Find My Phone makes you able to find where your phone is from wherever you, you are. Um, and here you can actually, actually see where your storage is and you have available, and you can buy extra iCloud storage if you'd like. Um, and if you see that you're kind of reaching that limit, you can decide, well, I don't really want all of my email messages to be backed up since they're going to be backed up on Gmail anyway, or the AU server anyway. Any other thoughts on, on setting those up? Uh. <laughs> um, I also think that Google Drive makes the most sense if you already have a Google account. You don't need to remember another username and password. Um, and it's best for collaboration. Um, you can really edit documents at the same time with other people. In Dropbox, things get a little hairy if you want multiple people to be working on a document folder, but you don't know which version is checked out at once. So if somebody has an older version that they're working on but save it at a later date, it might over, I guess, might overcompensate for a newer version that has edits, and you can't see those collaborations in real time. Um, but people like to use this for a kind of a privacy with, you don't get to mess with my folders, you only get a link to it. Uh, so there really is no collaboration unless you make that actual decision of, you, I'm giving you access to this file. But again, you can also make those distinguish, those roles within your Google Drive folder too. Yeah? I just have a quick comment. I was tasked as a research assistant to find a place to drop documents uh, privately for grant management between different organizations, INGOs, and everything. So I went and I researched both of these throughout the whole process, and I ended up coming to Google Sites, uh, which is under the Google Realm. Uh, mm -hmm. As an edu uh, education account, you get 100 gigabytes to start dropping docs, oh. right? Nice. So free, 
and you're able to then privately invite different uh, accounts in. And it's been wonderful for managing and being able to organize within the folders in the Google site itself and personalize it to the grant management project team. Project management, Google sites, just go pitch in. I'm a Google I like person. it. I like it. Um, these are the type of most popular files that are on Google Drive. You've got documents, spreadsheets, presentations. This whole presentation is actually on Google Drive. That's how you got access to it so easily. Um, drawings and forms. And I thought we'd best to just, Google has so much more time and resources to tell you more about it. This is Google Drive. <laughs> it's where I upload and store files. Like my stories. My recipes. My class presentations. My photos. And my super access and spreadsheets. But Drive is more than just storage. I can create. I can share. And we can edit at the same, same time. time. So wherever I go, my stuff goes with me. I've got everything I need. Whenever I need it. In Drive. And I thought that we it could use a little bit more on the... Um, a little more uh, information about the mobility of Drive. that you can do you Google how to use Google Drive in the classroom you get 60 million search results I think it's best for doing any sort of collaborative projects if you're asking your students to make a paper in groups perfect they're probably already using it now and just saving it as a Google, as a Microsoft Word document um, to begin with and uh, they can also use it to update things on whichever device they'd like if they wanted to look at their presentation on their iPad versus their laptop or ones in the lab versus their computer at home. It's really easy to just keep those synced in one place. Um, there's so much more that I really wanted to give a plug for a Google Apps workshop. This is listed in your folder here and please come join us over at, at Hearst for uh, some more in-depth discussion about what you can do with Google Apps. Anything else you guys want to share about that or any questions with, with Google Drive? Does Google Drive, so I use Dropbox, and one thing I found that was really helpful was a few weeks back I accidentally saved over an older file, and I lost mm -hmm. about 20 hours of code work mm -hmm. with this uh, data file. Um, and then I realized that after searching around for it, after pulling all the hair out, um, <laughs> I found it on Dropbox. It, it actually keeps it for a month, like anything you save there. Yeah, so it's the revision history. Google. Google Drive do that as well. You bet. Okay. Mm -hmm. But again, if for really important documents, I can't stress enough three places. <laughs> and that includes like student grades, I think would be you know, invaluable if you lost all of those, right, as you're supposed to you know, put those in. Um, if you want to have some time to test it out, I have a whole uh, folder with things I made for another presentation on using Google Drive for teamwork. Um, and there's all different types of files. You can see what it looks like to collaborate on something. You can see what comments and replies to comments look like. All there for you. This is in a link, you know, obviously in the presentation. Bitly slash teamwork folder. Take you right there. Um, I also have an example of how you can use a form to collect links to 
student documents. So if you want all of your class to make their own do Google document, they can make a form, say, give me the link to it, and it'll make a spreadsheet of all of their links. So on to the next one, student attendance tracker. Does anybody do this um, currently, use their phone to take attendance at all? Not yet? I loved this teacher's aid app on iOS. <laughs> um, so I couldn't imagine you know, just going pen and paper again. And unfortunately, they don't have an Android version, but the kind of biggest functions were that attendance tracker, and there's an app for that, um, and the random student picker or group maker, and there is an app for that too on Android. Um, with that teacher's aid, you can add pictures, you can add the full student contact information, you know, tap through. Let's see if I can show you an example over here. That has all that backup and restore as well. You know, taking your role, choose that day, um, click through, um, absent, not, make some notes about that student that day so you'll be able to have that instant assessment area. Um, you can pick, really, I, I can't believe we lived without this, you know, uh, <laughs> a random student to call on and it'll go through each of the students and you can actually you know see who your students are to speak with directly to them as well um, and it'll choose each student once before it goes back and chooses people for a second time and it can also make you know pretty easy random groups um, you know I wanted to have two groups you can make uh, four groups and see what that looks like. Um, you can set a reminder, so you can choose, you know, every Tuesday at 1140, you need to take attendance and it'll send a notification to your phone. Um, there are also other areas in here where you can do some of this, uh, the standard grading elements, so you'll know what those uh, points would be. Um, and I'm not sure if you want to get into that because there's a whole philosophy about standard and weighting grades. But, you know, once again, you can actually, while you're taking role, and you see that Andy Warhol is absent, you know, you can, you know, text him almost immediately, you know, contact, if you want to put that contact information in. And uh, they have an easy way for you to um, upload all of your contacts in, from a spreadsheet into this. So you can copy and paste from your Blackboard spreadsheet into their, uh, I guess their own model, and that's available through uh, room220.com slash teachers aid, that's the developer's website, and they have all information about um, the spreadsheet you would just need to use um, and easily get it in and integrate it for Blackboard. Um, the kind of Android equ equivalence is this you know, beautiful attendance tracker. That is not so good looking random student selector, um, but I think the teacher's aid is actually being developed for Android, so I don't doubt that that'll be coming out um, in the near future. But again, having that ability to see the pictures while you're taking attendance and having it remind you to take attendance, I think would be terrific. How do you to virtual computer? Has anybody used the VCL lab at all? Yeah, share us your experiences. Uh, well, I had to use a uh, PCL for uh, one of the softwares and uh, Mathematica. Mm -hmm. So from using my laptop from home, I was able to connect to the to the university uh, server and then use the computer lab, mm -hmm. and it worked very well. Mm -hmm. So it it would actually go into the good thing is that it would go into uh, the um, uh, what's it called in the PC mode. Yep. On the Mac. So mm -hmm. Is, yeah, I think it's great because I, I would never have thought that I can get into a PC um, area just from, this is my iPad, I swear I should have a regular iPad. And you can just log in. You know, you, you head over, hit the virtual desktop button over here, go to that vcl.american.edu, virtual desktop, log in. You're taken like right there to an actual PC page. Um, and you can do kind of any application that they already have in the computer lab, which includes Microsoft Word, some of that specialized software like Mathematica, SPSS. Um, I found that this could be really interesting if you want to do all of your assignments or all your responses back and track changes for Word, and some of your students don't have Word. Uh, so they can give it to you as a pages or uh, a real text document or HTML, and you can send it back as a docx. And if they say, oh, I can't read it, I can't you know, open it, you say, well, you just go to BCL and open it through the Internet Explorer or the, the Firefox, 
and upload it through, through Word there and see what your track changes are if you don't want to um, change your method of making those, those revisions. And really, you save it to your G or your J drive. That drive comes with your, um, with your American account. And if you don't have that set up quite yet, just contact OIT, and they will make sure that you have your own space on the American server uh, available for you. Go ahead. You can download the client on your phone. I actually recommend trying it out first with just the virtual desktop. And you can just log in um, through, through whatever internet browser you have. The, I do recommend that the buttons aren't quite in the right position, like where you would think, you know, next or okay would be, like is log off down there. Um, and say, you know, connect cut is right there. But really all you do is just go in there. If you find yourself that you're using this all the time, you can download that client software or that app. Um, it might be a little bit faster connection and Yelena can, and we at CTRL will be happy to, to help you with that. So I'm sorry it's taking so long here. I wonder if a lot of people are using wireless at once. I know that happens at conferences some, sometimes. But again, this will show up to be, um, you know, that's a, that's a computer in the lab. It's so crazy. I'm accessing that from an iPad. <laughs> and it looks so old school, right, <laughs> to see that. Any other questions or things you want to chat about with a VCO or any other uses? I think there's SPS. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done it for in vivo. Um, mm. So they don't have in vivo for Macs. Mm -hmm. But um, I was able to work with a student who did a lot of research in, in vivo, building my data and encoding it, and then I could enter it this way. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. Oh, good. Great. So talking some more about that that back channel discussion, and. Does anybody a little bit unclear about what that back channel discussion means when you're able to have a live online conversation at the same time as another event is happening? So while we're talking here, I could have a list of tweets running behind me. Um, and that's just a new way to become, I guess, have a different way of engaging with students for uh, students that might not want to speak up. They might prefer using text or Twitter to chat or um, not having the conversation dominated by a specific student. So you'll have everybody being able to, to speak and engage at once. Um, this is just an example of, over here, of uh, somebody giving actual conversation or speaking while live tweets are being projected behind him. So I could potentially have, I guess, the Twitter for Ann Farron happening at the same time. Let's get on here. And you could be tweeting questions to me. I think there was a, bless you, there was recently a discussion about um, a presenter at a, a tech conference was really poor and got grilled while just, you know, tweets were being streamed behind him live. So you have to be comfortable enough to be able to address these and look at what's happening at the same time. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely a way to get student feedback. <laughs> Has anybody used any of that, or the synchronous conversation in the back, or been at a, a presentation that's used that? Nothing yet? At a conference, I haven't really looked at it. The American Evaluation Association had that going through, at the conference like five days or something. Hmm. And we have that actually downstairs at the Ann Farron conference, and if we wanted to, right, we could have right. project, projected that behind uh, the plenary session speakers. They were doing it during the, uh, the lunchtime conversations. Oh, and great. I was putting stuff up there and stuff about creativity. Patrick Jackson and I were emailing and reacting to each other's creativity discussion. Oh, perfect. <laughs> were you able to participate in the discussion at the same time? Or you were I, just doing I, I, I was, was I was, but it, it was good. It kept me, you know, quieter than I would have otherwise been. I was supposed to be facilitating, so it let me instead of this, I could just do this. Okay. It worked out pretty okay. well. Okay. Yeah. Um and I also ask students ask questions on the fly, even whether there's not like, a, does anybody have any questions? So when they think of it, it pops up. Um, and you can see those questions and answer them pretty quickly and give feedback about kind of level of understanding issues. Like, do you guys understand what's, what's happening right now? Um, and kind of get that instant response. So Twitter is one way that students are already using this device. You can just craft it to meet your needs. Use a specific hashtag, which is that pound symbol, before a term. So you can make a specific one, like social media strategies class with Scott Talon over here used 
A-U-S-M-S-T. So these are all the tweets that related to AU social media strategy class. They kept tweeting about it on Christmas Eve. So they'd already been given their grades, the class was finished, but they were still so engaged with the material that they could keep the conversation rolling. Um, and I, I think it's a, a great way kind of just to keep that conversation outside of the going on outside of the classroom um, and to engage with one another on a peer-to-peer -peer level and connect with one another so you see other interests. If you're friends with somebody on, on Twitter, you're following them on Twitter, you're seeing what else they're doing and that they're real whole people. Uh, same with your, your professors too, seeing what else that they're interested in, what they're tweeting about. And one way that the social media class uh, kind of had gauged their assessment with it is tweeting about a summary of their class. So everybody must tweet 140 characters about their favorite part of class every class session you could see what everybody got from it so just to make sure that everybody's listening and then you could gauge immediately if oh that really was not what I wanted to say <laughs> or we need to go over that again <laughs> it's just you know a, a different way of collecting those immediate thoughts um, another another really cool tool is poll everywhere so let the video speak for that so you're getting a presentation and you want to get some feedback from your audience Show of hands, how many of you have signed up for office hours? One, two, four, fourteen, fifteen. That's not very accurate. Old voting methods take far too long, and expensive voting systems like this one, well, they're difficult to set up and don't allow for audience comments. That's eye clickers. Introducing poll everywhere. Through a simple web interface, poll everywhere lets you collect instant audience feedback. Just type in a question and your audience can respond using laptops, tablets, or even mobile phones, even your crappy flip phone. Hey guys, what do you think of my presentation so far? Is it A, amazing, B, incredibly amazing, or C, not that great? To respond, just text message the number on screen. Or use a custom URL to respond in the web app. You can even use Twitter if that's what you're into. As people respond, results are embedded instantly into your presentation, in real time. Seriously, guys? You can also ask open-ended questions. What is your favorite part of my outfit? You have to pay for that option. You can be able to delete tweets. Just, just heads up. You can even create segmented cross-tab analytics. <laughs> the best part about it is you can try it today for free. So how excited are you guys about poll everywhere? A, can't contain it, or B, not at all? Kaboom! Instant audience feedback. So if you guys would like to test poll everywhere, I had this up before, um, you can either text that number and send that. So what you would do is ask your students to send a message to this number, but you start out that message with that message with this number to go first. Or you can just go to a tweet with that uh, Twitter handle, or go to pollev.com slash CTRL, and this prompt will show up there immediately. Courtney, was this your submission? submission? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so we got one submission. I think that it, uh, oh, there you go. So you can choose different way of displaying it. Um, I had this kind of randomized go, and I'm sorry that the screen doesn't show perfectly. I probably should have, you know, calibrated that beforehand, but I've been switching so much. Um, and with the free version, it's 40 responses or less will be free. Uh, Above that, you have to pay, either have each of the students pay, and that would be $14 per student for unlimited responses, or you can get, I think, a $350 student or teacher account, which would have unlimited students uh, for up to 200 polls. And if you're interested in anything with that, again, it's perfect for our appetizer session. Um, and a similar thing is Socrative. Uh, has anybody used Socrative in any of their classes? It's free for 50 people, but since it's a brand new tool, there's not allowing anybody over 50 yet. Um, and it's kind of a little clunkier, and you're given specific options. Um, let me show you. I guess you can see over on the, on, the, on the left screen for you. 
like A, B, C, D, just like those clickers, instead of um, kind of more questions that you would come up with specific answers for. Let's see if I can get it here too. Um, we, can, we can test that out. Actually, does anybody have any interest in, in Socrative? I wouldn't necessarily recommend it right now, but you can come you know, speak to us later about that. Again, these, these clickers, you actually have to pay money for the devices. We do have some on loan that we can offer and discuss with you at another time, but it won't be something um, to just test out right now. You actually have to make an investment with that. Memorization, Study Blue. It was fabulous. Courtney, would you like to share how you found it and or how you use it? Right, so I'm auditing Kiswahili, so a language course, and I was looking to, on the go, have flashcards. So I did a little bit of research looking different. Um, there's a lot of great ones that you can just use on the computer but don't necessarily have apps to be on the go. And this one allows you to save your place if you're going through flashcards and taking a quiz. And then if you access your um, account again on the computer, it'll pick right up where you left off. So no matter which device I went across, if I was quizzing and I would want to study my ROMs, it would then be able to let me go again onto it. So I just did research across it. And then someone actually came into one of our appetizers and was looking for a similar tool, so I recommend study blue. There are so many students at American University currently using Study Blue, and they make their decks public for everybody. Um, 150 million student authored flash deck cards. Um, if you want to pay for more extra things, you can have a teacher account that actually tracks your students' progress through it, see how many they got wrong, see how often they do it, see how long it takes them to do things. Um, That'll show up actually right over to the right. It'll have this like neat little analytics dashboard of what's what's happening. Um, you can use text, images, or audio. So I bet one of your uh, ways, I guess we could pronounce words in Swahili, mm -hmm. and you can say which, <laughs> what is it, or maybe spelling would be an interesting way to, to take that. Um, I really think that the idea of, of having a your teacher be able to see your progress um, with those flashcards is terrific. It might be a little bit invasive, but you'd actually get to see what students are doing at home. <laughs> Very interesting option. For group communication, I was chatting also with, with Courtney about how students are speaking with one another, and she loved a program called GroupMe, which is group texting. Um, but I think I'm still with Remind 101, and Remind 101 is an uh, easy way that professors can have a private one-way conversation with students. Um, it's like from reminding things about uh, class attendance or um, classes canceled, a quick way. I mean, we've all read about how email is now just old by, used by old people and texting is, is what you need to do to get attention. Um, but if you don't want to disclose your number, then this is an easy way to let students um, still have that communication with you but not get them all that contact Remind information. Remind 101 provides a safe, free way for teachers to text message hmm. students and stay in touch with parents. Not necessarily the parents part for Remind us. 101 is simple. Sign up and create a class. Tell your students and parents to subscribe. Then start sending messages. Remind 101 is safe. Teachers never give out their personal phone numbers, and they don't have access to the numbers of their students or parents. It's one way only. Plus, message history can never be deleted. So Remind 101 is built for teachers. Field trip reminders, motivational messages, homework or exam reminders, and more. Extending your classroom has never been easier. To get started, go to remind101.com or download the iPhone or Android apps. Safe, simple, free. That's Remind 101. Well, once you sign up for our account, you're given that uh, screen that asks you to, anybody that wants to subscribe, to send a text to that number using that specific message. Um, and then when you gather all of those contact information into your app, uh, which you will never see, you will never see their numbers, you can sort by periods or courses and then send texts to your whole course at once. And you can also set them for future times. So if you um, notice that nobody's showing up for your eight o'clock class and you wanna send a text at 7.45, then you can just set that you know, in advance, far in advance, whenever, whenever you'd like. Um, 
Oh, I've heard great success with it. Has anybody used anything similar to it? I think that privacy is kind of key. Sure. Can you attach things? Um, you know, I don't think so. I do announcements but I... on Blackboard all the time. Usually I don't attach things. Mm -hmm. Usually I just broadcast the announcement, but it's that old person email thing. That fits, I hold. <laughs> but um, it, there was a way I could load the spreadsheet from Blackboard with the names, the email addresses. That would be so sweet. Mm. But maybe it still work. Maybe. Well, the loading that spreadsheet would be good in the um, one of those attendance apps. Yeah. yeah. Um, unfortunately, this is supposed to be like you don't ever know their their right. email addresses they and just, they don't know yours. Right. Mm -hmm. They know their email addresses. <laughs> Fair I'm, enough. I can, I can email them individually at Blackboard. Mm -hmm. That's not their real email address. But. <laughs> Fair enough. Back here. That's what I wonder if anyone who's used it has had any trouble with students actually signing up for it. Because I think that would be, you'd have to require the class to sign up at the mm -hmm. very Right, so that's kind of a, a honor system, is if you want me to, to send you information and reminders or information about class, um, if there was a, you know, a water pipe that broke <laughs> and you want to be able to text everybody immediately, but you don't want their numbers, the people that did sign up won't show up to class. I guess that's the benefit. <laughs> um, and so with that, I just have you back to this tech menu so we can continue the conversation. These are. Honest to goodness, drop in hours. You come in and we're here to help you and to come up with some ideas for your use of apps. Is there anything else that you guys like to return to or play around with? I'm not sure if there's any other ideas or better apps that you guys can't believe I didn't talk about today. You couldn't survive without. Good reader, you pitched that before and you didn't mm -hmm. this time, so I'm curious. I just wanted to know, I've been being swayed by Naomi's, I guess, conviction that you shouldn't be reading stuff on your mobile device. I'm not sure how you guys feel about that. What do you What do you think? Well, good reader, you can do a lot of stuff with. You can mark up things, mark and, things and up, send that fax and sign a lot. I I don't use it for much reading. I use it for storage, either on my device or in the cloud. It interfaces nicely with Dropbox, and I manage it with the other drives, boxes. I'm not sure about that, mm -hmm. but I found it a way to have a hierarchical nested file structure on my iPad and iPhone. Mm -hmm. And I missed that so bad. Yeah. Because that let me do that. And mm -hmm. they just keep, there's a lot of other features too. Um, Good reader's nice. terrific. That's definitely the uh, one I was champion out of all of them. Yeah, and I don't use it to read much. I mean, mm -hmm. there's um, Annotate, I think, at Jackson, which is Annotate or Annotate Plus. That's yeah, kind of fun too. It does the same kind of thing, but it lets you store and then view all sorts of files, lots of formats. Mm -hmm. Very flexible. So I annotate and, and the good reader are good for I annotate, that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I use good reader a little more. Uh, I think I annotate was uh, $3.99, was good reader around the same price or $1.99? I don't remember. Okay. I don't. It's been too long. I've had it for years. Right. I mean, and you still make use of it, so that's kind of a good app. I do. I wouldn't give that one up. Wonderful. <laughs> Anything else anyone can think of? Sure. One question I uh, have is how do you save all the links that you need to the different things in your browser? Sure. So what I usually go is again um, that bottom arrow. One of the options is bookmark, or add to reading list, or add to home screen. You can add to home screen. Yeah. yeah. So you can make so when I like an app. so let's say I'll, I'll add this to home screen. Add it, and it shows up right in the bottom corner. Uh, right, my polls. That's, that's what, what it was. The app is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a home screen. Perfect. Not a real app. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say about that. Uh, okay, I'm sure it will be <laughs> Anything else? Well, I think you some. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's content specific. Sure. Rather chemists than there's a periodic. There's a lot of different periodic tables. Mm. It's, um, it's actually put out by a chemical company. I use it all the time to write tests because it has all the content more embedded than a typical periodic table. Hmm. So What's it called? Um, it's it's the company's EMD. EMD. So, so it comes up as EMD PTE for periodic table of the elements. So it's not. I mean, I also have one that's like a really fancy, colorful one, but this one ends up being the. I use it all the time. Hmm. And what was that other? Um, 
super uh, secure Dropbox. Spider Oak. Spider Oak. Cool. I'll make a note of that and send it all out to you later. Um, thank you again for joining me here today, and I'd really appreciate if you did those little evaluations and handed them to Courtney on your way out, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>